Welcome to Heliotropes. My name is Julia. And my name is Kojo. And today we're going to talk about empathy. Yes, yes. And Kojo's been dying to get these words out. Yeah, for so. the past hour. Yeah, so you want to start? Um, well, I mean, just with a preface, you know, again, as always, you can fast uh, speed everything up, <laughs> you know, just hit the settings, go to speed, um, play speed or whatever. And this kind of, we're bringing it back to, you know, at the beginning, we're like, you know, giving all a snapshot, a glimpse into our conversations. So this is a conversation that we actually started uh, about an hour ago. And I've been dying to talk about it because <laughs> Julia has been like, we should do a podcast about this. And I'm like, yeah. So does that mean you want to uh, pause this conversation to the podcast? Or like, can we talk about it and then talk about it on the podcast? And then Julia rightly brought up that, you know, like we'll talk about it forever and then like we'll be like, oh, we should have made a podcast about it. So this is the first time that we're like talking about this, you know, no research, no anything other than what we've already known and um, what we're bringing to the table right now. So hope you all enjoy and get to engage. This is like the actual glimpse into our conversations about this kind of stuff. So uh, we're talking about empathy and how did it come up? Um, I mean, the question, essentially, the central question that we're at least starting with is this question of can you teach empathy? <laughs> came up because I think Kojo for teaching class. <laughs> yeah. And he said, you can't teach class. And then it took me a minute to get what he was saying. And I disagreed. And I said, yeah, I think you can teach class. And right. he disagreed with me. And then, you know, we started talking about that. Or I said something like, you can teach class, like you can teach manners and how you interact with other people the same way that you can teach empathy to other people. Right. And then he went, nah. <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, now here we are. Yeah. And I think that's, this is an easier conversation to have, at least for me, because I know more about empathy, I think, than I do about class, you know, as far as like <laughs> class the thing. We're not very classy around these parts. Um, yeah, we're actually pretty anti-class around these parts. So, you know, I can talk about that kind of class, you know, if we want to get Marxist and shit. But as far as, um, yeah, no, so I, where do you want to start? I mean, I guess, you know, like y'all take a minute, a few seconds, however much time, if you want to pause it and think about that question. Can you teach empathy? Is something is empathy something that can be taught? You know, what's your evidence? What's your you know like? So okay, my starting question is to you: is what does it look like? Okay, one, what does empathy look like? Um, and I guess two, what is empathy? Not in that order. Mm -hmm. What is empathy, and what does empathy look like? So I would say that empathy is being able to understand where somebody else's experience and where somebody else is coming from. So being able to take somebody else's perspective on things and put yourself in that situation and, and, um, and try to understand their experience as fully as possible. And we know that it's, you can't you know, fully understand somebody's experience, but then the empathy are those emotional connecting points that you have by then better understanding that person's experience and where they're coming from in the current situation that they might be experiencing. Right. So what does that look like? Like, what does it look like for somebody to have empathy? <laughs> okay, I'm not good. I'm not sure if you mean like teaching empathy or having empathy. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is that what it would look like is being able to um, like connect emotionally with somebody else, understand how they might be feeling in a given situation, and be able to like talk about what their needs are and their feelings, and be able to kind of like be with them in that emotional space. And that can, I mean, that looks a lot of different ways depending on what that relationship is like. And I think oftentimes, like, one of the goals for empathy is to create a, um, a stronger connection to other people. Because if we can understand other people's experiences, right, then, like, we are all connected in a community together, right? Like, we understand how we impact other people and how they impact us. Um, and that can open up lots of opportunities. Okay. So you're saying that empathy 
is. <laughs> I'm just... I feel like Kojo's setting me up to take me down. I'm not. But that's fine. <laughs> that's... I'm here for it. Not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to empathize with your <laughs> understanding of empathy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so empathy is is that I mean, capacity is the ability to understand um, people deeply to understand people's experiences and people's feelings, um, thoughts deeply, and then to demonstrate that understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, as you noted through a number of ways, listening, you know, engaging, um, with the object of empathy. Um, okay. So, I mean, I don't know, like, you know, again, this is, uh, conversation unprepared so i'm not really like i don't have the structured way of like approaching this but when i think of the idea of teaching empathy because one of the things we brought up one of the things i brought up was um like sociopaths like uh my understanding of teaching the idea of teaching empathy is that if empathy can be taught then oh okay so taking it back a little bit when julia said you know it's like teaching empathy you know like you can teach empathy and I paused for a second because, like, I didn't immediately disagree, but I had to think about it and process it. And then I was like, I don't think you can teach empathy. You know, I think you can teach empathizing. I can think you can teach people how to empathize. But the actual empathy, I don't think that's something that can be taught. Because if empathy can be taught, then you can teach it to sociopaths, which... Um, you know, like <laughs> as a general understanding, uh, of our, you know, as a general feature of our understanding of sociopaths, you know, is the belief that, you know, sociopaths do not have the ability to empathize. You know, they're pretty egocentric. Um, something's missing, right? Like that's one of the defining features of sociopathy, um, as far as empathy is concerned. And, you know, Julia was obviously like, nah, like, you know, it's, you, can't, you just can't teach sociopaths empathy. You know, like, not everyone can be taught everything, which, yes, you know, I agree with that. But my thing <laughs> is, is if you can't teach someone something, okay, my thing is, <laughs> uh, this is why we do research and like, write <laughs> stuff down. <you> know. <laughs> this is for all you therapists out there. <laughs> So, yeah, also, yeah, this is a very niche episode. I think our, our episodes are usually pretty niche, but this one's particularly niche. I mean, niche. I would disagree with that, but go on. Okay. I don't think this is particularly niche. I Compared think that... to the other stuff we talk about? Yeah, I mean, one of my things was, like, I feel like more of my friends who are therapists listen to us talk yeah. so that <laughs> they'll just all be on my side about this, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's niche as far as... <laughs> it, might have some, <laughs> yeah. it might have some inputs, but I think the idea about teaching empathy and empathizing is not a niche idea and something that everybody could benefit from. Yeah, I agree. But go on, go on, since we're now getting away from, you know, Kojo throwing in the hot... Uh, the exception, you know. <laughs> what about sociopaths? Okay, so I don't see. That's the thing. I don't think sociopaths are just an exception as far as teaching, or I think they're a really important except. Okay, so one of the examples I used is, um, I and I'm not gonna. Yeah, example. I'm not gonna use that example. But I want it. The idea here is that. Okay, I'm gonna bring up Noam Chomsky again. But if you subscribe to like Noam Chomsky and you know, since so many of y'all are therapists, this is, I mean, it's <laughs> not even, yeah, yeah, hopefully maybe therapists or philosophers, you know, or people who think deeply about the human condition. One of the central questions, right, of the human condition, this goes back to Hobbes and Rousseau and obviously even further, but you know, to put that Eurocentric perspective on it, the nature of, um, morality in human beings are we intrinsically good are we intrinsically bad or are we essentially a moral blank slate and i think um at least this is a uh, chomsky is one of the major like public um proponents of this idea because amongst all the other things he talks about with his background in linguistics and like political dissidents and all these things is morality Right, and that's been a central underpinning of his whole perspective because, um, I mean, because right, like, 
because that's how you, <laughs> that's the grounding, that's the foundation from which you can leverage effective criticisms against, you know, everything that empire does, you know, all the bad stuff that empire does. Because if human beings aren't intrinsically good, then um, really, and this is the big thing about atheism, right? A lot of religious folks will um, leverage this kind of critique against atheists or people who don't believe in a higher power in that there is, if you don't believe in a higher power, and I don't think you need to believe in a higher power, I think you just need to believe in the fundamental goodness of people, um, but one of those two, if you don't believe in either of those things, then you really have no ground from which to like, you know, deliver any sort of moral criticism, right? Because what's the basis of, uh, if, I, if I'm a nihilist, absolute nihilist, you know, <laughs> and I don't believe in a higher power or the fundamental goodness of human beings, then whatever moral stance I make up is fundamentally arbitrary, in which case, you know, it can change at the drop of a dime, things like that. So um, I think of, you know, Noam Chomsky, when I think of one of these things, he goes back to uh, David Hume, you know, English philosopher on like, you know, morality and all these other things. And one of the things, uh, you really find it like everywhere, Adam Smith. So even when we go back to capitalism, right, he was like, yo, capitalism's going to work you know, can work because people are fundamentally good and will fundamentally look out for the other people in their nation. That's the only way for it to work. Obviously, we see that that isn't happening. But what he says essentially is that, you know, I mean, he believes that evolutionarily, uh, outside of spirituality, there is a fundamental capacity, like a gene, like a genetic predisposition for human beings to be good natured, to be good to one another. Um, so... That's essentially saying human beings are fundamentally good. And if you, like, I mean, the a question there is what is that fundamental goodness? And I think intrinsically that fundamental goodness is empathy. It's the ability to empathize. Um, so if that's something that's fundamental to human beings, I don't think it's taught. You know, like, I think human beings are born with the capacity to empathize. Human beings who lack that capacity to empathize, you know, from birth uh, are, or due to, I mean, yes, let's go with presumably from birth, turn out to be sociopaths, right? And that's the vast, it's a minority, right? Like, what is it? One to 2% of people in any given population, you know, might be uh, successful sociopaths. Um, or something. I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. A successful sociopath. I do think it's really important <laughs> yeah. to state that uh, there's more to sociopathy than this. So, like, please yeah. don't go around assuming that people who like you feel like are <laughs> void of feelings are yeah. sociopaths because you know, let's yeah. not get into that. Yeah, true, true, true. Yeah, sociopathy. <laughs> I mean, we're just focusing on one feature of like uh, many things. And as with anything in the DSM, <laughs> there's a lot of overlap between everything. So, you know. And a lot of fucked up shit. Yeah, and a lot of fucked up shit. But my point there is that if you believe that human beings are fundamentally good, empathy is a critical part of that fundamental goodness because what it means to be fundamentally good is to have other people's interests in mind, to be able to look out for other people, to feel what other people are feeling, right? Like there's any number of, you know, if you go into like the neurobiology of the brain, like, you know, Western scientists have been really keen on being like, oh, look at, <laughs> look at these, you know, mirror neurons, like, oh, you know, like babies will smile when they see someone else smiling. You know, there's all of these studies that suggest that we have all of these, you know, genetic predispositions to relate to other people, which is, you know, otherwise empathizing with other people on a really fundamental level. Um, so I think in that sense, it's fair to say that empathy doesn't need to be taught. Empathy is something that we already have. We already come to the playing field, right? Like, um, you don't, anyway, in that, with that being said, what we're teaching, and I think, you know, what you're describing when you talk about like teaching empathy is teaching the behavioral aspects, a certain set of behavioral aspects of empathy. And really what it is, is cultural empathy, right? So how does empathy differ? How do, how does the behavioral manifestations of empathy differ from culture to culture? 
I think that's what we're talking about. And that's what I mean by empathizing is what we're teaching, you know, because what looks anyway. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I think so because people have the ability to do something doesn't mean they can do it or know how to do it or know what it is or that it doesn't get pushed out of them after years and years and years. And then they need to relearn and be retaught how to do those things. Yeah. So like, I'm not sure I totally agree with you, but I think as always, we've come to a point where Kojo has a very different philosophical take on what we're saying, but we don't actually like disagree fundamentally, uh, necessarily. Although, you know, like this question of, you know, fundamental goodness or fundamental badness Mm -hmm. is not something that I've explored very thoroughly, probably since like ninth grade, you know, (laughs) history, since I had to write a paper on it then. And I argued that humans were fundamentally bad because it was easier to support. (laughs) 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 Which I think that's a, that's a valid position coming from like whatever ninth grade social curriculum uh, was in place. I mean, you (laughs) Any, I think that's a really valid position coming from a Eurocentric educational standpoint. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really easy to, yeah, there's a lot of evidence. For that. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think that people need to agree that people uh, are fundamentally good in order to believe that people have empathy and have the ability for it. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, uh, uh-huh. yeah, I mean, go ahead. Well, what's your, what's your deal between like having the ability for something, but not needing to be taught it? Like what word are you going to use in place? Foster, develop. Right, so when I think, I mean, another thing, uh, another feature of this, you know, as Julia noted, our philosophical differences, I also have. Um, my particular approaches, values, understandings of like pedagogy, right? So that's something that comes into mind too, is that not just, uh, I'm not just filtering this through my understanding of empathy um, and morality and goodness, but my understanding of teaching. Because when I think of things that can be taught, I think of things like mechanical things. Um, What I'm teaching, right, like we were coming from our Capoeira class. So in a sense, Capoeira is something that can be taught. Capoeira is a set of, I mean, it's a culture. It's a movement, it's music, it's lyrics. All of those things can be taught. Like I, you can stand in a field <laughs> on an island alone for decades with everything you need to survive and try to learn Capoeira, but you won't. Because, you know, like, unless you can tap into the ether, you know, you're not going to learn it. And you won't have anyone to demonstrate it to, right? You can learn, you can, sorry, you can teach someone how to put a puzzle together, right? It's a mechanical process. You can teach someone how to um, paint a specific picture, right? But you can't teach someone um, how to be a capoeirista, right? Like you can teach someone everything they need to know to like do the movements, to do capoeira, but you can't teach someone how to like hold it inside of them, how to value that. You can demonstrate it, you can model it, but like, you know, you can't. But do they not learn that from their experience of learning all of the aspects of it and then embodying that and making it their own? Yeah, they can. Okay. But that's, that's not teaching it. I mean, okay, I feel like you're getting very persnickety about it because, (laughs) like, if you teach somebody all of the aspects of something, right? Because I would argue the same thing about empathy. Like, a huge thing in counseling really is helping folks either have empathy for themselves or other people and understand various perspectives. And really, I mean, it's not just in counseling. Like, the world would really be better off if there was a lot more genuine empathy floating around. But um, like teaching people emotional intelligence, right? Like it's, you can teach them all of these different skills around how to do that and how to like train themselves to engage in those processes. And then however they choose to interact is gonna be a little bit different for everybody, right? Like you and I demonstrate empathy differently, but we both have it. And I don't think that 
like do I think some people are born in a capacity that makes it maybe like more natural feeling or where they demonstrate it in different ways and that feels a little bit more natural? Yes, but I think that people also learn, like you're saying, through modeling and understanding and then bring it in and make it their own. Hence, like, I do feel like people are taught empathy, right? Like you learn, you can be taught how to take someone else's perspective and how to understand them and what certain cues might mean. And then you learn, right? Then you might learn like culturally what that means and like how that might impact somebody else and how that impacts you, right? Like it's a process of learning. And then you put all of those things together and then you're holding on to all of those things. Okay. <laughs> I mean, again, I don't disagree with you. Um, okay. But I do think there's a See, difference. See, I knew there was a but coming <laughs> because I'm a therapist and we understand how those things work. Okay, I don't disagree. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. But. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I really, it's a semantic thing. And I think yeah. this semantic Most difference... Most of our disagreements are. ...is an important semantic yes. difference. Most you know? of the time we believe that. Because the idea of teaching empathy... Still, I mean, like, at the core, the idea of teaching empathy implies that people aren't operating with sufficient amounts of empathy. Um, which, you know, again, looking at this world, like, I think uh, we have a culture that is... And we have had a culture for the past few hundreds of years or at least the modern global culture is kind of hostile to empathy you know empathy doesn't fit into the capitalistic paradigm because um i mean it just doesn't <laughs> actually mm -hmm. it has a very useful place as far as empathizing with the capitalists the more you can empathize with the capitalists um and aspire to them and i would say that's not even that's a bastardization of empathy yeah. you know but there is a place for it yeah, and alienating and casting out, like, sensitivity. I was right. listening to uh, Bro Diallo's show yesterday yeah. for part of it, and somebody asked a question about, um, I forget exactly what the question was, but it was about the U.S. being, like, an overly sensitive culture or something <laughs> like that, right? And, like, we hear that all the time, like, snowflakes or, like, oh, why, like, why is Gen Z so sensitive about everything? And really, it's like, Gen Z's like, do you think maybe you could respect people? Right? Like, that's what it is. But it's like, oh, you're being overly sensitive. And, like, the United States is not a sensitive country or culture. Like, the American culture is not a sensitive one, right? It's a violent culture. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's also, like, empathy and sensitivity towards other people and their needs and their humanity is also used as a way to kind of, like, cast out and shame um, and separate then, so, I mean, like, given all of that, I think it makes sense to kind of, rest like, there is a need to restore some sense of the ability to empathize. But I don't think it's <laughs> restore, restoring, a restoration teaching. of mm -hmm. empathy. Yeah. Like, okay. Because, again, I mean, like, and so I guess here's the other thing is, like, on the other side. Because you all know, I mean, you know. Uh, we've talked about it before on this podcast. We've talked about it, you know, in person. But, like, I think, um, like, our psychological paradigm, like, our paradigm of understanding the psychology of human beings, the Western paradigm, um, that most of us have subscribed to and uh, been in school to, like, I mean, we've been indoctrinated into that this paradigm. And I have a lot of critiques of it. And one of my critiques here, as far as empathy is concerned, is the idea of, if I'm coming from a place of thinking that we already have empathy, we're born for the most part with empathy. And then you're coming from a place of thinking that we can teach empathy. But I'm not coming from a place that we're not born with empathy. Yeah, but I mean, it's just the idea, and I'm not saying you specifically, but the idea that we teach empathy implies that you were giving empathy to people who don't already have empathy. When I think the, the critique, I mean, the critique that I would have is that we're born with this great ability to empathize. I mean, look at kids and how kids interact with, you know, what little, you know, indoctrination they've had as far as, like, you know, being emotional and teaching empathy. They are very empathetic. We are empathetic, for the most part, human beings, creatures, um, up until a point. And then 
we hit something, right? And if we think about like things like sociopathy and like all of the other conditions, many of the other conditions which would hamper people's ability to empathize, it usually comes from, I mean, it often comes from some form of abuse that uh, presumably, you know, is being uh, perpetuated by someone whose ability to empathize is compromised, right? So there's a cycle there, right? Society creates people who have compromised ability to empathize and then that uh, manifests in like hampering the ability of children to empathize. So my whole thing is that, well, one is the rhetoric, like the idea that, you know, if we can teach empathy, we're teaching empathy to people who don't already have empathy. And then two, the idea that um, you can teach something that people already have. Because when we look at children, again, like we can look at children and watch them interact and say, like, they're so empathetic. And we could say they're intrinsically, innately apathetic. I mean, sorry, <laughs> empathetic. <laughs> innately empathetic <laughs> um, in their relations with each other. And we can also look at them and say they could be more empathetic and this is how we can do it. But that doesn't mean we're teaching, right? Like, are we teaching more empathy? Well, and I think that's an important question because I... Like, when you empathize with other people, like, I think your well of empathy can grow, mm -hmm. right? And, like, and it can diminish, right? Like, it can shrink and it can grow. And I think a lot of that has to do with your interactions with other people and what those interactions end up looking like. Um, I mean, and a number of other things, really. Right. So can you not teach how to grow that well of empathy? E I, I mean... At like, the moment, are you saying that people are born with a fixed no. ability to empathize? No, I think empathy is one of our, I mean, like, to the extent that empathy is a thing that we're born with, I think we have an endless capacity for it. And to your point, I think what we're teaching then is not, um, we're not teaching people how to grow their well, right? And we're not necessarily growing other people's well. Although I do agree with that idea of teaching, right, how to grow the well. What I think is happening is when we go to that child and we look at them and we can say that child can be more empathetic and here's how we're going to help them be more empathetic. What we're doing, right, that's the thing is like we're not teaching them more empathy. We're teaching them how to be more empathetic with empathetic and empathizing being words that describe the behavior of expressing empathy, right? So what we're teaching is how to express empathy in a given culture. Mm -hmm. And the more fluent they become in that expression of empathy, the more they themselves can understand and, you know, grow that well of empathy to further express. So do you think that every adult in this culture has like the same capacity, has the same empathy? What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, if, if what you're saying is that, like, it's not taught everybody's born with the capacity to empathize and this um, never-ending well of empathy, then, like, what about people who are perpetuating, like, horrible things? Like, what? Right. how do you respond to that bit of, like, not that you don't need to teach them well that you don't need to teach empathy where well, is see, that's empathy? the thing i'm not saying you don't need to teach empathy i'm saying you can't teach empathy what you can teach is how to empathize so are they so like if you grow up and that and you're never taught how to empathize and your well of empathy never grows or whatever and it just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and you're just a miserable fuck who does bad things. <laughs> yeah. Like, so what? They can't be taught empathy? Yes, no one can be taught empathy. I mean, that's my, my position and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> okay, um, so like, then what? But like, they can be taught so how to empathize. Just, but with what well of what? Um, okay, so... So they're just going to do the behaviors even though they don't feel them? That's... A, okay, so... The behavior, I think, so it's important to teach how to empathize and teach how to be more empathetic. And again, 
those words specifically, empathizing and empathetic, the actions of demonstrating empathy being behavioral. It's important to teach the behavior associated with empathy in whatever given culture because those behaviors help us tap into the core, like empathy. Empathy being like the core, the thing that you can't teach, the thing that you already have um, internally in some capacity, right? It helps us tune into that. And the more we can demonstrate that, right? This goes into the whole like, you know, behavioral science, uh, right? The thing, right? That pencil experiment and, you know, the act of smiling can help you be more happy, right? So, you know, fake it till you make it kind of thing, like whatever that study was. And I don't know if like, you know, psychologists regard that as uh, credible anymore or like what, the significance of it but at least you know in concept the idea being the simple behavioral practice of smiling of doing a smile right the smile itself isn't <laughs> happiness you know it's not like you know you're you're actually ecstatic right but yeah the practice of doing a smile stimulates an internal change in like your emotional state so i think the practice of doing empathy right, which is empathizing or, you know, being empathetic can stimulate, you know, again, a, a similar change, right, similar in nature, right. Um, so it's, it's useful, right, it's useful to go over and, right, so, I mean, to you. So, so basically your argument is that uh, everybody is born with empathy. Yes. Empathy cannot be taught. Right. Empathy can diminish. Yes. And you can teach people how to empathize to help expand people's empathy when it's been diminished for whatever reason. But that's not teaching empathy. Right. And the more that people empathize with other people, the greater their, emp or the, their empathy will be restored if it's been diminished. Yeah, something like that. Okay. I would use different words, obviously, because... A lot more words. <laughs> yes, yes, many more words. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. I mean, I'm not sure. I don't think either of us got... I mean, I understand your point. I don't think either <laughs> of us got any closer to agreeing, because I would say when somebody's empathy has been diminished, whether it's um, through... You know, like adverse childhood experiences or really like abusive experiences or because they grew up, you know, when you think about people in this country who grew up not ever needing to give a fuck about anybody else and just stepping on people to get to the top, right? Like that diminishes empathy. I think that you can be taught how to empathize and then you can grow your empathy well again. And I think you can teach, and I think that is teaching empathy. However, we have a disagreement on that. That is semantic, even though we both <laughs> think it's important. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Are we done? Because I got another thing. Mm, yeah, we're pretty much done. I do want to say that, I mean, another thing I think about when I think about empathy is maybe... I feel like people have the capacity, it's such an innate part of us that we have the capacity to empathize with something, right? Like we have the capacity to empathize with creatures outside of the human species. Um, we have the capacity to empathize with many creatures, many organisms, many living things, and also like very a narrow scope of you know, limit, living things. Uh, so I think that's important to keep in mind too, because even when we think about like the most most ruthless capitalist, or like going back to this show, right? Like pictures of you know like old Southern white folks, and not to limit it to the South, because you know most of the states in the Union, this country, have had some sort of lynching um, before, um, or lynching habits practices. A fundamental cultural disability inability to empathize with a subcultural population mm. um, and even within those people so again in this case I think about like the images of white people you know t 
taking standing with their families and like taking a picture after a lynching or just like a group of white men standing taking a picture after a lynching and thinking about like there's a fundamental sociopathic like lack of <laughs> empathy for obviously the person who was lynched in that photo and also they still demonstrate the AE capacity presumably in some sort to empathize with the other people in the photo and the families behind the people in the photos so like i just think it's all that's kind of like uh, it speaks to me to like an enduring quality of empathy is that you always have it uh, and sorry you don't always have empathy but like it's one thing to think about empathy as the ability to relate to a number of different people but we all have some sort of block right and this is where the capacity to grow our empathy comes from right we all have some sort of block as far as our ability to empathize with a certain group of people and we all have some sort of targeted population to which we tend to exercise you know those expressions of empathy um so even right like even hitler had people who he cared about even bill gates <laughs> you know has people who he cares about um there's always a capacity to grow and there's always the potential to, um, well, anyway, go ahead. What was, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important point that, and, you know, I think there's another kind of question or to be had there on like what, I mean, that's just a more in-depth conversation about empathy and human connection, right? And like what it means to only be able to connect with a, your small circle, like if that's your family, and do you actually care about them if like really you just want to protect them or you feel a duty to them or something like that, right? Like is that actual like care and empathy and understanding them and their entire personhood? Right. And I think the answer to that a lot of times is no, right? Like, uh, mm. Yeah, I mean opening up a whole can of worms here yeah and really my next question was just about liquor so i mean <laughs> <laughs> oh the nip thing yes <laughs> look i got a problem with the south <laughs> and now they talk about liquor um yeah but yeah we can go to that okay. let us know what you think in the comments uh about empathy and yeah and shout out to kim in yeah. scotland yeah and Holyoke Rose, because, you know, Holyoke Rose. Holyoke Rose. Um, all right. Yeah, let us know what you think about empathy in the comments, please. And this is my next question. Do you know what a nip of liquor is? That's it. And if you do, you know, let us know in the comments and let us know what state or country you are from. What is a nip of liquor? Because people in the South, apparently, that's not a thing, and I didn't know that. But it might be a thing, and it might just be a Kojo thing, because he yeah. doesn't. He was like, what's that? I've never heard of that. Period. I mean, maybe I had, because it took you saying it a few times for me to, like, connect, like, the word nip to what you were talking about. Uh-huh. You know, I might, like, at first I just thought you were, like, being cute, you know, and saying, like, oh, you know, nip. So, like, maybe <laughs> I have heard of it before, but, like. But then when I asked the person, I, I'm i trying to make ice cream <laughs> for a friend's birthday and do a taste test beforehand so it doesn't suck, like, my last batch of ice cream. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I want a nip of this. And I got home. I didn't, like, look in the bag as I left. I got home, and it was a bottle. Yeah. Like a this big of a bottle it was not a nip not a nip and so then i thought wow maybe you know like that's really not a thing yeah anyways i'm gonna it. bring it back to empathy okay. <laughs> <laughs> um but like really just out of curiosity like one do y'all see the semantic difference like what the the uh semantic discrepancy and do y'all think it's uh reasonable right because you know again just to summarize our positions <laughs> our very similar positions i think that empathy as a human whatever i think empathy is innately is innate to the human condition 
on under most cases. And where it's not, we recognize that as, um, uh, you know, psychopathology, a psychopathological, um, you know, error, anomaly, difference. It's notable. Um, so I think empathy is innate to the human condition. And as most things that are innate to the human condition, you can't teach them. What you can do is teach how to express them. Um, I would look at children and the way children interact with one another and with other adults and cite that as evidence of um, empathy in practice in its kind of most uh, basic form, natural form. Um, and then further suggest that from that point on, what we're teaching is not empathy, but the behaviors associated culturally with our empathy, right? Because when we're like, if I teach if I teach someone how to be empathetic here in the states, that might not necessarily translate to like, you know, empathy in Mozambique, right? Like, you aren't like fundamentally, you're not, you know, automatically empathetic because you've been taught how to be empathetic here. And if that empathy doesn't translate, if that empathy, because I'm using it that way, doesn't translate to somewhere else, then it's not actually empathy that you're teaching it's the behaviors of empathy which you know are known as empathizing being empathetic you know like the actions of expressing empathy mm -hmm. that's my thing and yes like even people who don't have it who we view as not having it can be displaying some sort of or expressing empathy in some very particular ways um Possibly not towards people, but towards um, other non-human living creatures. Um, anyway, and yes, I think our capacity to express empathy, as our capacity to express um, empathy grows and diminishes, so does our ability to understand uh, and to, uh, so does our empathetic well, I, I think that's a good term, our well of empathy grows or diminishes. So I think there's a direct correlation there. But I think, anyway, that's my position. Mm -hmm. I know. Do you want to summarize your position? I... You don't have to. <laughs> Excuse me. You. I mean, I don't think it's necessary, but my position is that teaching empathy and teaching someone how to empathize are essentially the same things. All right, we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>